Um, I'm a preacher by heart, and so I have three points, and I'm going to sit down. Um, <laughs> Y'all yeah, think I'm joking. God's provision, God's position, and God's push. Those will be the three points. I'm giving them to you early, um, and we'll walk this journey um, if you'll allow us. Um, what, as I sat and I reflected about what I would share here, um, I realized that so Community of Hope um, is um, a young church. We started, I plant, was blessed to plant the church. It's an AME church, um, and so it's a young church plant in a traditional denomination. Um, which gives us a, a unique kind of place to be because we're trying to do some really progressive stuff in a traditional denomination. And so um, we started April 16th of 2006, April 16th of 2006. This is significant and important uh, because my first point was God's provision. And I believe that God has provided in some very unique ways um, to help us along our journey. Um, we started April 16th, 2006, and Twitter started March 21st of 2006. Um, God started Twitter just for us. Um, <laughs> God loves us that much. Um, Facebook started in 2004, but really kind of, you know, came of age around 2006. April 2006, um, if you ask me. Um, and the reason I say this is because um, that God knew that we would need some free stuff. Um, God, people ask, well, well, how did you get so connected to social media? It was free. Um, <laughs> and so it's funny because I heard Nadia and Eugene, you know, kind of talk about how, you know, they don't kind of really think about this stuff. It's natural to them. Um, I'm on the other side. I think about this stuff all the daggone time. Um, I'm talking about that I was looking at whatever free thing I could use and how I could use it um, to be able to help us along this journey. And Twitter, Facebook. Facebook, um, that stuff was free, and I was going to ride it till the wheels fell off. I really was. <laughs> ride it until the wheels fell off. Um, uh, uh, some history of Community of Hope. We started April 2006 on Easter Sunday in a nightclub, um, in a fully functioning, fully working nightclub. Actually, Tuesday and Wednesday nights were strip night um, at the Legend nightclub. And, and, and so um, we didn't have Bible study on Wednesdays at the Legend. Um, <laughs> We had it at an elementary school, and we had to tell our members, um, if you're going to the legend on Wednesday night with a bunch of ones in your hand, that is not your offering. Um, or at least it's not your offering to the community of hope. <laughs> And, and so we started um, April to Easter Sunday in the Legend Nightclub, and what we did was we shaped a whole campaign. We shaped a whole campaign, whether it was Facebook, whether it was Twitter. Um, we connected with a lot of the promotions people for clubs, um, and we utilized their web, um, we utilized their e-list and, and their websites, and we promoted this kind of piece. All of the um, all of the paid stuff that we did um, was on this one radio station. It was an FM radio station, WPGC ninety five point five, the hip hop station. Um, we didn't promote on any church station. We didn't know. We spent no promotion to any church venue. And our whole promotions was um, come meet Jesus at the legend um, this Easter. Um, come meet Jesus at the legend this Easter. The legend was a club that had been around for years. It was a landmark kind of a nightclub, notorious kind of a nightclub, a hood nightclub. Um, it was come meet Jesus at the legend this Easter. And because of some of the relationships we had with various types of people, um, especially in the radio community, etc., um, it just caught fire. Um, on our first day there, our first Sunday, um, the people who were supposed to open up fell asleep in the club, um, and they didn't open up on time. And so we were supposed to have services started. We started with two services, a 10 o'clock and a 12 o'clock service. We were supposed to load in at 7. Um, the people, the club had just closed around 5, and so those folks fell asleep. We couldn't wake them up. They finally woke up around 9, um, and we had a 10 o'clock service um, um, to give a sense of who we are as a church. Um, I didn't like the club sound system. We brought in our own sound system. We thought the club sound system was too weak for us. Um, and so we got this whole load in of a sound system we have to do. Um, and so now we had planned um, on opening the doors at 9.30 and allowing folks to kind of come in at 9.30. Um, but now we're loading in this sound system. Um, I'm paying the sound guys extra. I, I just tell them, look, if you can get us up and running by 10, uh, there's an extra $200 for you. Just make it happen. Let it be done. Um, 
Um, and so at this point, this line is, is wrapping down the street and around the corner. But I told you all, we shaped this whole campaign. We even did press releases because I knew that if we started a church in a nightclub on Easter, um, that we had to get some kind of press on it. And what ends up happening is that because there's this long line going down the street and around the corner, on Monday morning, um, on the front page of the Metro section, the Washington Post and the Washington Times and the Washington Informer, is this picture of this line wrapped down the street and around the corner of these people trying to get into the club um, and it's our church. Now, now I'm sharing that because a lot of our campaign was social media or this new media, but also we utilize old media along yeah. the package. So we did radio, we did TV stuff, we did um, um, the, the Washington Post gave us free publicity, so we did the traditional kind of press release to help us along the journey because for us, a new media is just one tool in a range of tools to help us to get the word out. And so we watched what we call God's provision. We were blessed um, that when we first started the church, a gentleman who was the owner of Livestream, Livestream TV, um, which was a streaming company um, that streamed churches, church services, um, he knew of our work, he knew me, and he gave us a streaming platform. He just gave it, he said, I want to sell this into your ministry. And so um, as a brand new church, uh, we had our own streaming channel and on-demand channel. And so we were able to put up videos. And what that did was it allowed us to look older than we were. Um, and that's important for a church that starts in a nightclub. And any church planner knows um, that could be very helpful. It allowed us to look, to, to look like we were older than we were um, in a land of mega churches. Um, it also... Um, allowed us in that time period um, to also be able to reach people and it extended our reach. Um, and so we consider ourselves to be high tech but also high touch. Um, and so we utilize Facebook, Twitter, all those kinds of people, things to be able to reach folks um, and that we can't necessarily reach. We saw extreme growth um, in those early years. Um, we've grown from zero members um, um, to about right now about 2,700 members. Um, and so in that first year, um, we, we saw about 550 members members in that first year. Um, but I was the only staff person. Um, yeah, exactly. She's like, Shh. yeah. And so what do you do? Sometimes growth can be like catching a runaway train, um, that you're trying to make sure that you're able to connect with people, you're able um, um, to have the systems to grow people. Um, our challenge was um, that our church had been focused on generations X, Y, X and Y and Z, um, but also the unchurched and the uncommitted. So out of that 550, um, 55 percent, um, we were their first church. Um, they had never been to church. We, we were their first church. And half of the other half, um, they hadn't been to church in at least five to eight years. Um, so 75% of our folks um, didn't have any kind of church pedigree, understanding of church, or necessarily um, didn't understand how to move in leadership or service in church. And so we spent that first couple of years just trying to grab a hold of and th this kind of large group of folks who were coming um, faster than we could be able to handle them and be able to continue to connect with them as we pulled staffing on and those kinds of pieces to be able to handle the growth. And so that was provision. Uh, that Livestream TV, they gave us um, the site um, that um, a early along the journey, um, that same radio station um, that we did the advertising on uh, called and offered me a radio show. Um, and so it's the major hip hop station, but they offered us a gospel radio show um, to be able to, they said, hey, w would you like to do a gospel music show in which you can kind of talk about what y'all are doing and play music on a Sunday morning. Um, and I said, um, how much do we have to pay y'all? No, no, we'll pay you to do it. I was like, oh, I love God. God's <laughs> provision. Um, as things have gone along the journey, um, what we watched was our video team. Our video team ended up being a group of guys who we had um, in my previous position at this church called Ebenezer Amy Church. It was a mega church, about 10,000 member church. Uh, we had been able um, to, to negotiate a truce among some rival crews in Prince George's County, Maryland, who had been shooting each other. Someone had been paralyzed, someone had been killed. We were able to kind of get in there and navigate this truce. We found out those guys um, had little rap groups. They used to shoot music videos. And so we, a lot, we helped them um, to take those video skills and they ended up being at Ebenezer. Um, Ebenezer brought two of the crew 
leaders on staff, full-time staff, but we also utilize them to do video at the church. And so as a young adult minister, they'll do all of our young adult Bible study um, video. So when I started Community of Hope, they became our video team. And so we've got these kind of crew cats who are now the video squad. And so they were able to shoot the video um, on a budget for us. Um, we paid them, but it wasn't what they would rarely get paid. Um, but we were able to kind of work those things. So it's what we see as provision. The other thing is position. I mean, I learned a great lesson um, a year into it um, on our first Halloween, our first our second Halloween. So we started in a nightclub, were there for about nine months, and then had an opportunity, got some um, a 30,000 square feet inside of a shopping mall. We are the anchor store, or the downstairs of a former anchor store in a shopping mall, a current vibrant shop, well, not vibrant, but a shop, Burlington Coat Factories above us, Foot Locker, Downtown Locker Room, all of those are in our neighbors. Food court is upstairs, we're probably the only church um, in our area where you can go to church and then go upstairs and get snickerdoodles. Um, <laughs> and a milkshake, um, but, but what we saw was um, that the, on our first Halloween inside our new space, um, it was Halloween and we had decided we are going to do something um, for our young people, kind of what we called Hope Fall Fest, an alternative to kind of regular Halloween stuff, and so um, we had decided we were going to do like candy and, and some hot dogs for our young people, and we had planned for, we had about 120 hot dogs about 120 hot dogs um, on this Halloween. And uh, we get there, we set up, got you know, some little games for the young people. We're going to have just a wonderful time, got all this space. Um, we you know, haven't been there long enough to actually have much to do in the space. Um, so we've got, but we, I mean much that we own in the space, so we've got all this space, we're going to do all these games. Um, what we didn't realize was that for the mall, the mall had been in that community and was a central place for that community for the last 30 years. And the tradition was that every Halloween, the community would come to the mall to go trick-or-treating. And it would come to every store and go trick-or-treating. Um, and so um, where we thought we were going to be kind of dealing with about 100 and something young people, maybe 200 young people, I told you we had 120 hot dogs. Yeah, those hot dogs went in five minutes. <laughs> um, went in five minutes. We ended up uh, seeing that day about 1,500 people. Um, so 1,500 people that just bumped into us because of our position, because of where we were located. Um, and, and, and what um, God showed me in that um, was, and this connects to our social media, because say this last Halloween we saw about 4,000 people come through. Um, but we were pre uh, prepared, you know, a gang of food, a whole bunch of candy, uh, magical clown, bands. <laughs> I mean, just everything, just the, had killed the fatted calf, just everything was there. Because we realized that these were community folks who um, may not connect with us any other time. And so we were going to have everything in place to be ready for them. Um, and what I realized was, um, and what caught a hold of us was, that that's what the internet is for us. That that's what social media is for us. That we had to look at the way we were shaping our social media stuff was wrong. That we were shaping it just for our community. We're shaping it for our church. We're shaping it for church folks. But we had to realize that really um, that our position on the Internet, that we're connected to so many more people um, just by where our location is. And so for us to be a church inside of a mall, we bumped into so many more people just by where we were located and realized that social media, the Internet, this new media stuff has positioned us in a way that we can connect to so many more people than we ever could before. And so it shifted our thinking about it. It shifted our thinking. Um, let me help you understand how it shifted. It, it shifted it because it allowed us then to say that we're both high tech but also high touch that allows us to touch more people, um, people who we may never see, but allows us to be able to connect with people um, in a very different kind of a way. Um, there's a sister um, who had come to our church um, who ended up moving outside of, um, just, just a little too far for her, didn't have transportation, et cetera, um, but she would still watch us on stream. Um, we would still connect sometimes um, on Facebook, and just periodically I may shout her out on Facebook, or she may you know, shout me out or, or connect on stream, that kind of a piece. Um, this sister, um, it, it's not an affluent kind of a woman. Um, our church is a, a kind of traditional, well, it's an AME church, but we live in Prince George's County. Prince George's County is um, kind of about 80-something percent African-American. So our, our population is mostly African-Americans, but this is a white woman um, who would be considered, um, in some people's kind of vernacular, almost kind of white trash kind of a thing. Um, and so, I mean, she just doesn't have much, but she would just connect with us, loved us, we loved her, we loved on her, um, but wasn't able to come out as much, and so we'd connect with her on Facebook. Um, about two months ago, 
uh, during a service, um, during our first service, well, our second service, um, I see her. I'm about to do benediction. I see her, and I just feel the tugging in my spirit um, to have her come up. She has a black eye, um, and, and, and I just wanted to pray for her. And I, and I say, sis, come here, and I, I just pray for her. As I finish the prayer and I hug her, I'm doing benediction, she whispers in my ear, I need to talk to you, but not around this man I'm with. Mm-hmm. So, okay, praise the Lord, and let her go. So they stayed for the next service because they had actually come early, um, had come early, and so they were there for the next service. At what point during the next service, um, I see her go to the bathroom, I look to one of my outreach people, one of my sisters, and I say, look, see that sister right there? I need you to go to the bathroom. Um, and I need you to tell her that pastor told you to go there um, and ask her how we can help her. Goes to the bathroom, um, talks to the woman. The woman tells her that this gentleman has been beating her up um, and she's in a, an abusive kind of situation. Um, and so our outreach team gets on it. We kind of talk to her offline then, but then she has to, of course, go out to the bathroom. We connect with her um, through some of the social media stuff um, afterwards, email, but we help her to kind of shape a, um, a, a plan um, so that she can kind of get up out of the situation, out of the relationship. Um, she hit me on Facebook um, a couple of weeks ago and just on my wall and said, I just want to thank you, thank the Community of Hope Church family, because I'm now in South Carolina. Um, you all helped me to get connected to my daughter, and now I'm living with my daughter, was able to get out of that bad situation. Um, and I've just experienced um, one of the best Christmases I could with my grandchildren. We were able to use some of the tools. Some of the tools were what? That we were able to stay connected with her just because she had been watching us on the stream and come to find out that she told that gentleman that day, look, I'm going to church whether you like it or not. Um, for so, she just felt so connected to the church and we had stayed such connection with her that when she was in that period of crisis that we were the place she felt she could come to. And so that is kind of that position. Um, the other thing is push and I'm about to be done. And the push is um, that what we realize is that God has been kind of pushing us to realize um, that like I said that social media, new media has just been kind of one tool for us. Um, and the piece for us is that now we've um, to, um, come to understand there's a need for us to enter into the larger arena of just media in general. So we're about to start um, a company called Hope Media. Um, under Hope Media, there will be Hope Records, Hope um, Films, Hope TV, Hope Publishing, and Hope Fashion. Um, and it's with the whole intent of, um, of having an impact on culture. Um, a whole intent of being able um, to allow other voices to be in the cultural atmosphere. Um, I, was, uh, I was sharing with some folks the other day, um, I got a call, I was asked to be a part of a reality TV show. Um, and that sounds like a wonderful thing, you know, be a part of a reality TV show. <laughs> and we want Reverend Lee to be a part of a reality TV show. Um, and, 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 and there are ways in which actually there's some stuff we may shape, because we actually may shape some reality TV show um, in a way that can be helpful. Um, but this re- reality TV show is going to be called Finding First Lady. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, it was a mixture of The Bachelor and The Apprentice for a preacher. Um, and they were going to have 20 women fight for me on TV. Doesn't that sound like something I would want to do? Um, they, 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 they even said um, that there would be you know, some competitions, and so there may be the fish fry competition in which whoever cooked the best fish dinner um, <laughs> to, could get the date with me, all that kind of stuff. Well, of course, I told them no. But if you look right now at some of the stuff that's being offered in the media realm, and if you look at the way the church is being presented, the way the gospel is being presented, uh, that we have to have some other voices out there that can show us in a different kind of a light because we look horrible right now. I'm talking about it's just a rough thing. Um, I've come to give you all gifts. Um, this is um, our first mixtape. This is the Hope, um, the Hope mixtape. It is our praise team, some of the music that we offer. Um, I've gotten some for all of y'all to get, and I'll have them up here. They're free to you all um, just because you came here today. Um, th- th- our app is coming out. Our app will be out in March um, on Android, iPad, um, etc. Um, we've already done a project. We did a project with United Way and some cats called Dreams Work in which we did um, a-, a short film. It's about 50 minutes. Um, on it, and it, we have Russ Parr, Raheem Devon, the, vid- um, the Grammy nominated singer, um, as well as some other folks. It was done by young people for young people um, that was dealing with um, youth, um, that was dealing with bullying. Um, we've got some projects we're working on um, around youth youth violence and especially youth dating violence. But, but for us, it is how do we utilize, we also um, have a studio we're building, um, a, sound, a, a recording studio in one of the middle schools that we have um, pro, 
programming with. Um, the, the young people who I told you who were part of the gangs that did the video stuff, we helped them shape a nonprofit. And now they're in three schools teaching video, um, uh, um, teaching video skills. And so what we're doing is we're utilizing all of these pieces to kind of come together to connect with the kind of work we do in the communities that we do the work um, so that as we utilize new media connected to old media um, that it can um, help further on the gospel mission. Thank you so much. Mary had a little lamb named Baby Doe, and Baby Doe says, follow us on Twitter at hashtag DigChurch13. Don't y'all let Baby Doe down. Follow us, Twitter, hashtag DigChurch13.